Hey, welcome to the Rick Helps Real Estate Show. I'm with uh, Kent Schweiger today. And uh, you know what? I'm not showing your names up there. And I'm going to make sure I have everybody's name showing. Um, I'm trying to look and see how to do that here. Um, see, we do things on the fly here. So, um, no, nope, it's not letting me do it. Well, anyway, Kent, welcome. You reached out to me. Gosh, I don't know what about two, three months ago, telling me about these services that you provide for people that don't live here that have rentals and people that own short term rentals. And you are a licensed real estate agent. And uh, I thought you'd be interesting to talk to. Yeah, thanks, Rick. It's really good to see you in person. And, uh, you know, I, I can tell you what attracted me to even reach out in the first place was the fact that you're like a no BS realtor. Um, there's a lot of fluff out there in this world and, you know, you just are the opposite of that. So I appreciate the opportunity and would love to talk about, uh, you know, rentals today for sure. Well, I appreciate that. Cause I think what you, in fact, I have a friend that, uh, was, I was telling him what you and I were going to talk today. And he said, uh, he goes, you know, we're, we're going to be buying a home in another state. And he says, and I, I, I got to find a service like that because we're not going to live in that house all the time. And I know here in Arizona, that's uh that's pretty common. Snowbirds come in and they they leave and and you have property management companies. But how much service do they really provide? And you you have put together a website and uh, let me show the link down below there. And the, so tell us about, you know, about what your service is and what it, how why it's different. Well, OK. And there's actually this service appeals to three separate audiences. And so we can just go through each one of those. Um, the first the first audience would be the snowbirds that are coming you know, and they spend just a small amount of time, you know, in a home uh, in and out or they're here for, let's say, half of the year and then they, they vacate. And what's interesting about this is, like, my brother-in-law, you know, he's stuck in Utah with my mother-in-law. And so anytime she has a to-do, I'm sure she hates to call him for help. But at the same time, um, he doesn't like receiving that phone call either. So he's spending quite a bit of time helping her. And so the, the first model of this or the first audience that I was targeting really is to provide an assistance to those who shouldn't be on a ladder. They shouldn't be changing light bulbs. They can't lift, um, you know, salt for the water softener. And that just morphed. If you go into like the, um, the homeowner there on the right hand side and you look at the list of services that just morphed into all of those items that we don't think about that people need help with, especially if you're a little bit older. Um, and I just built the whole company based off how I could help those individuals. So that's pretty cool. So let's say you got a home check package, total maintenance package, concierge and a la carte that and starting from 35, that's, that's pretty good. So, you know, cause I mean, there's a lot of things that can go on when you're not here in the summer, we've got those monsoon storms and they can tear a house up. And, you know, does the property management company really ever send a bunch of people out in their cars to go, check it. No, they usually have a renter in there and they'll call if something's broken. But if the house is vacant, um, you know, how do we know that they're really going out and saying, uh, hey, you know, Kent, I went by your house and there's a tree through the roof. Um, this one is interesting here. Cycle water in sewer traps and all drains. I showed a house online um, yesterday. I did a walkthrough. I'll come back to that site in a moment. And so it was uh, it been on the market 140 days and it's a flip. Can't, as soon as I opened the door, I about passed out. Right. Because if you're not circulating that water, man, does that stink. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, no one likes a rotten egg smell in their house. And if your house is for sale, it um, doesn't matter the value, the price, a buyer is going to absolutely think that, that there's something wrong with the house, even though it's literally just a couple cups of water in one drain. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of small things that... Um, you know, we look after, and again, that kind of appeals to what it is that you're pursuing. But at the end of the day, like I said, you really got to think about it from the perspective of the individual who is a homeowner. And that's typically somebody who lives out of state or is not able to take care of the house themselves. And all of those services, even some of that we don't think about, like, for example, 
you know, like vacuum out refrigerator coils. You know, who actually does that? I don't, I don't think I've ever done that even in my own personal home. And as I was thinking about it, the way appliances are made today, I mean, they're already designed to fail. They, they have a one-year warranty, and then they'll slap like a 10-year warranty sticker on there, but that only covers the compressor. And uh, at the end of the day, if you don't maintain and keep that heat down from those coils, you're probably going to burn out a fridge. And so all of those items that are out of sight, out of mind, we focus on, and they transition, whether you're a snowbird or where you're, you're VRBO or whether you're a long-term investor you know, for some rental properties. It's all the same difference. Yeah, and it's also a big problem here too in the summertime with all of our dust storms that, you know, try as you may, dust is going to make it into the house and it's going to get into your air filters. Your air conditioning's running not, you know, at 75 degrees. Maybe you're gone and you're leaving it at between 90 and 95, but your air conditioning unit can ice up if those filters are clogged. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and that's the exact same concept as those, those refrigerator coils, same technology. And so you get in there and like, the minimum that I'll visit is once a month. I have some clients that are you know, doing weekly visits, but at the end of the day, in 30 days, your air filters, especially during the summer, they're, they're plugged and you go into any rental. It doesn't matter if it's a luxury rental. If you go into any rental and you just stare up at the ceiling, you're gonna see a, a couple things. You're gonna look at that grill in front of the, the air filter itself and it's gonna be just caked with dust and it's pretty disgusting. And the other thing, which is related, but not really related, Rick, is you ever stared up at the bathroom vents in like a luxury home and the bathroom vents have that caked on dust as well because they're sucking up. And so all those little things, like I'm saying, all those, they make a big difference. But, um, you know, during some remodels, I've pulled those vents down in the bathroom and it's just caked. Those fans are going to burn out eventually if you have you know, a half inch thick of dust uh, sticking to all those you know, blades. Oh, I know. I had a condo. I sold it in Scottsdale. As part of the inspection, they said that the bathroom fan wasn't working. And uh, she was a single mom. And so we agreed to fix it. And uh, so, but my clients were, they had already moved uh, back to the Midwest. So I uh, got up there and tore it apart. And it was, it failed because it was all caked with dust. Right. And, and I, you know, I spent $19 and got a new fan and put it in there, but I spent more time cleaning everything out of it because, and, you know, you walk around your house and it's clean and everything, but rarely does anybody, especially renters look up and go, I should probably open that bad boy up. <laughs> right. They won't. Right. Yeah, they don't. <laughs> they don't. And then the property management companies, I mean, I'm sure some of them do, but they really don't look at that either. And who's going to call a handyman out to replace an air filter? So they really just get unchecked for, for months at a time. And eventually, I mean, I've even been in some houses where I go to replace an air filter and it was so caked up, it got sucked up into the actual unit, you know, like just gone. And so you have to fish it out. And that leads to a bigger problem because now all of your coils inside your air handler are coated in dust and your efficiency goes way down. Yeah, and then you can have a real moisture problem, and then the, the pan fills up, and it just, instead of spending, you know, 9 to $15 on a filter, you are now got a $2,500 insurance claim. But, right. So what do, you, what do you provide as far as the short-term rental market, the Airbnbs of the world? So the short-term rental market, to me, that's, that's a business that I really want to build out um, and focus on. I, I did some short-term rental to traveling nurses um, in Utah, and I, you know, I try to manage those long distance. And one thing will just tank your review ratings and cause you a lot of immediate headache trying to find people to to fix an issue. You know, for example, um, my HVAC thermostat was turned, you know, way up, and it was super hot, and it was, you know, 105 out heat wave in St. George, Utah, and trying to find someone to go out there and actually get the thermostat turned back down was very difficult. Um, another one of the famous is like bath, you know, if you're looking at your bathtub and you're coming in for vacation and there's some hair in the bottom of it, because like that's always the last thing to get cleaned out by the cleaners and it's always left over. So as far as the VRBO right now, if you really think about the market and, and the way that it's headed, there's a lot of people that bought homes saying, I'm gonna come and have, uh, come to Phoenix and have a house and live here. But while well, I'm not here, I'll rent it out as a Verbo. And those individuals are not prepared to deal with the actual service side of what being a good neighbor means and being um, also a good host. 
And so the whole business is built uh, around that. So for example, um, you know, we've gone to some Airbnbs ourselves, and I get coffee and get the groceries late at night. And, you know, so I get coffee in the morning and like, there's no sugar. And so a VRBO that has no sugar, and certainly I'm not going to buy a bag of sugar at the grocery store. So there's all of those items that would just make your stay so much better. And I take care of those. Okay. That's interesting. Cause a lot of people, I know they have, uh, um, management services that take like 30% mm -hmm. of your, uh, um, of your, you know, of your, of, of your revenue and they, they provide all of that. So do you do it on just a flat monthly, monthly basis or do you take a percentage? How do you no, manage no, that? No percentage. So in an ideal situation, the way that I see it is I, even though I'm a, a licensed real estate agent and, and can perform, perform like management services and collect rent, I personally, being a property manager myself, like I own my own properties and rent them out, I would much rather or give the advice to somebody to say, maintain the control of, of you collecting the rent and then allow somebody like me to focus all of my energy on actually performing the services. Because right now, the typical short-term property managers, yeah, they charge 25 to 30%. And quite honestly, if you were to go do and, and re, go through and read reviews from Verbo and Airbnb, even if they are represented, how much are they missing? Um, because they're mostly focused on, again, vacancy rates. They want to get the vacancy rates up. They're not really having anybody go in behind them and you know, behind like the tenants or even behind the cleaners or the handymen to make sure that that house is ready to go. So at the end of the day, I would I would say I would pay a flat fee to somebody like me that can come in and make sure that you're going to have a five star rating and all of the small details are handled versus a property manager that's going to just get the tenant in, get the tenant in, get the tenant in. Because really, most of those not tenants, but the guests, most of those guests that are coming in, most of them are coming from Airbnb and VRBOs, you know, website. Anyhow, I know that there are some you know big agencies out there that have their own websites, but really those main players are driving the business to your verbo anyhow. Well, speaking of that, and you, you may not know the answer to this, but what, what is your pulse on short-term rentals? Cause just like everything else in YouTube land, there's people like, Oh, the uh, VRVOs are going to be flooding the market and everybody's going to put them up for sale. And, uh, and yet um, I know in Arizona in Phoenix, especially Scottsdale, there was this huge expectation for the Super Bowl that, they could get whatever price they wanted to ask for, and and they didn't. They were di deep discounting them almost 75%, and the problem was that mom and pop homeowners said, well, let's go to Flagstaff for the weekend and, or the week, and we'll rent out our house. So it flooded at the inventory, and so they didn't get the big Super Bowl bang that they hoped. Some did. Some did quite well. Actually, a lot did. But are you sensing that, that there's maybe – um, some short-term people that want to just walk away from it and put their home on the market and take their capital gains? Yeah, I, like knowing human nature and how people are. So if you think about, you know, we have interest rates, you know, 18 months ago at 3% and everybody jumps on the bandwagon of buying a house, which that's great. You know, locking in a 3% rate is, is phenomenal, but it's not for the weak of heart. And so, when, when I start getting my, you know, and again, this is in Utah, it's not Arizona, um, but when I start getting clients that are not really real estate investors and they're calling me saying, hey, what do you think? Should I get into a VRBO and I really want to go buy a house here or there? That's to me the sign of when the market is over because they're always the last ones to enter. They're always the last ones to pay the price. Well, actually, technically, they're the first ones to pay the price because, you know, the market corrects and, and they bought it, uh, you know, at the highest point. And so you have those individuals out there. So if, if you have an out-of-state um, owner and they're like, let's buy a house, let's rent it out while we're not there, make a killing, yeah, that's good. Um, however, you're now competing with a lot of people that are not in a great situation and they're going to be the first ones to lower their rates. And as soon as the monthly rates start coming down, now the people that bought in at 3% are just breaking even. And so the psychology behind that with, with all of these individuals is, is it worth it? And so they're going to be, in my opinion, they're going to be looking at, hey, converting these into long-term because they're a little bit easier to manage. 
you know, because you don't have me, right? <laughs> but yeah. it's the truth, right? I mean, like, the, so then we go into the long term, and it's just that cycle and trickle effect how it, it balances. Uh, and I will say, you know, my my son, he's having a, his first, you know, baby, and he's like, I want to move to Phoenix. And so now my wife has been looking for homes that have, like, a guest house. And she cannot find one that's under, like, $2 million. And we live out in Cave Creek, Carefree, yeah. Scottsdale. And so at the same time that I say all of this, there's still, in my mind, a housing shortage, unless there's there's one caveat to this. If you live in a, a subdivision where you get to choose from one of eight models, those are going to be the ones that, that really, start, in my opinion, really start to suffer. Um, but as far as housing prices and um, correction, I'm not really sure we're going to see too much of a correction, you know, doom and gloom in the right around the horizon. Well, it yeah, it's it, you, we can roll the dice on that one and try to figure out where it's going. And I look at the numbers every day, but I, I the short term rental thing, it's I I can see by the numbers that we're saturated, yeah. especially when you get to a town like Sedona. There's a thousand of them up there. There's only ninety seven hundred residents that live there. So anybody that wanted to buy a home in Sedona couldn't because it was a short term rental. Uh, but so I, I expect a bit of a shakeout. I don't expect a flood of short-term rentals hitting the market that makes the inventory spike in the Arizona market and house prices coming down. I, I think they're just going to be gradually up, up unloading them. I also don't see anybody rushing to do that until after spring training here. Uh, so I think they'll try to get them sold before summer if that's part of their plan. So I think maybe a third of the short-term rental people are, are contemplating that and that wouldn't flood our market. We're still only at 15,300 homes and the average that we've had over several years is about 27,000. So I don't think short-term rentals are going to flood out, but I think, you know, it's going to be a combination of two. Well, let me just put a long-term renter in there and I'll just ride this out or uh, let me sell it. But it all depends on when they bought. So I think, It'll shake out. And I remember Tina Tambor from the Cromford Report had a meeting with a bunch of realtors once. And she said, the problem with short-term rentals and Airbnbs, she said, now you got to be a real estate expert and an expert in tourism. And for some people, I don't think that's going to sh shake out too well. Right, right. You got to figure out, you know, what what's the airport traffic? What's the occupancy rate? Uh, what's trending? You know, what, that's totally different than, than, uh, um, you know, doing a long-term rental. My brother has one up in uh, Washington state and he said his bookings are way down and it's be they were way up during the pandemic times because people were not staying at hotels, motels, and they were leaving town to get out of town. He's over by the Olympic national park. So he was booked solid for like a year and a half. And he just has a little one bedroom place underneath his, underneath his house. And they were from all over the country and the world coming out there and, and but he said now he goes it's dropped off and i'm not sure why and i'm thinking well there's probably a lot of people saying that it's dropped yeah. off i'm not sure why yeah you know what's interesting about that is um one of so i have a house and it's it's set up essentially to, to rent out rooms you know if you get into a historic district you can usually rent out rooms uh legally and i'm not sure what the codes are here in in phoenix and scottsdale etc but with that said if you do have like the casita and you're lawfully allowed to rent it out it's so interesting because i i'm on furnish finder with that unit and i will not get a call for like six to eight weeks on it there will not be one email and then the local hospital will all of a sudden decide and approve we need traveling nurses and i will get that week a dozen inquiries. And so that's something that your, you know, whether your brother-in-law that you said or your, that is up there in Washington, he, um, you know, he could look at doing something like that and rent out to those, you know, those temporary nurses, the traveling nurses and see where it goes. But again, that's really hot and cold depending on flu seasons, et cetera. So. Yeah. And you, you brought up something too. You're talking about uh, guest houses. I saw, and it was in a forum that I'm in that's city of Scottsdale is saying if you have a guest house, you can't use it as a short-term rental. Mm -hmm. Now I'm I'm a little bothered by that because it, it's my guest house, right? 
I mean, I don't know how they can, you know, did they, is there going to be some litigation there? I mean, how can they tell me I can't use that for a short term rental? I can understand some of the new things that they're putting in as far as in order to have a license for your short term rental, we, you have to pay your, your tax. You have to be registered. You have to have emergency contact information. But I didn't think they could go in and tell you that you couldn't do it because the yeah. governor had said you can't, you know, that they were not, he was not going to allow them to be heavily regulated. Now they're trying to regulate it from an enforcement standpoint of not to let the complaints get out of hand. And if you have three complaints, they're going to pull your license. But yeah. I didn't think that they would get to the point where they would come in and go, nope. You got a guest house in the back. You you can't use it as a short term rental because there's places in Gilbert, one in Agritop Agritopia that I looked at, that the back of the house was a short term rental, totally separate unit, which I was yeah. kind of uncomfortable with because if I'm living there, I don't want to share my pool with strangers. Yeah. But that's what they did, and they got, on average, I think fourteen hundred a month out of that room in the back. So. Yeah. Can the city of Gilbert come in later and say, oh, you can't do that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I know for Cave Creek and Carefree, you, you can rent out your guest house only if you rent out your main house at the same time to the same tenant and, and or guest. Yeah, and so, I think that's what Scottsdale's doing. And uh, so I, you know, I don't I, we're from the government. We're here to help. I don't know. I just, yeah. <laughs> that kind of stuff just bothers me. Well, Kent, uh, I've got the website down there. I recommend people go take a look at it and uh, explore your services. I think you're you're offering something very unique. I appreciate you reaching out to me, and I think uh, uh, it's going to be fun to watch and see how well you you do down here. And uh, I think it's a it's a great service for people, especially if you're a snowbird and you're gone, and you know your management company is only going to do so much. But it looks to me like you offer way more than what we're seeing out there. So it's nice to share it with everybody. So. Appreciate the opportunity, Rick. Thank you so All much. All right. Take care and have a good one. You too. See ya.